So now we're going to start looking at the Cold War and how it affected things in the 1960s. We just got through looking at a section about the 1950s. Now we're going to carry on with this crisis, or as it, some Americans felt like it was called. So one of the big issues in the 1960s is going to be the Cuban Missile Crisis. Just a little background, Cuba at this time, this is the early 1960s, is a communist country. They are allies with the Soviet Union. USSR is the, the acronym for Soviet Union. And uh, part of the problem is going to be in the, during this time we send missiles to Turkey, which is very close to the Soviet Union. And during this time we try to overthrow the communist leader Fidel Castro, which ends up in disaster. And unfortunately the Soviet Union, just, they find out that we tried to overthrow the Cuban leader. So with all of this mixed together in this recipe, it's going to lead to the Soviet Union deciding to deploy missiles to Cuba. Now, our issue with them sending missiles to Cuba, let's look at this map down here. Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. So they are 90 miles from American soil. And this is where the Russians want to put missiles. And looking at this map, you can see why we start to panic. The medium-range missiles can reach towns like Miami and Atlanta and... Houston, the, inter the intermediate range missiles can reach all the way to New York City, to the nation's capital, to Chicago, to some major cities. So, of course, this is going to lead to a lot of panic. You're going to have kids that during this time are going to have to practice duck and cover drills in their school in case there's a nuclear attack. You're going to have people building bomb shelters, uh, having to wear dog tags for identification in case there is an attack and your city is bombed. So this is going to lead to mass hysteria and panic. Um, this is kind of a tension, this leads to a lot of tension over a number of days, and in the end, uh, they decide to, um, they decide to withdraw, the Soviets decide to withdraw their missiles and not take them to Cuba, and it would have been kind of difficult because we had a naval blockade around Cuba. We had ships keeping things from coming in or out, such as a Soviet ship with nuclear missiles. So the Soviets decide to withdraw their missiles, and we agree not to invade Cuba and we agree to withdraw our missiles from Turkey. This is the closest we come to war, to a nuclear war during this time. And this is going to later lead to banning further nuclear testing. And it's also going to lead to, um, in a long time from here, this reduction in having these buildup of these nuclear missiles. Also in the 1960s, you're going to start to see, uh, actually in the 1950s, but more in the 1960s, you're going to start to see this increased involvement in Vietnam. The reason why we get involved in Vietnam, remember, we're all about containment. We don't want communism to spread from where it already is. So the reason why we end up getting involved in Vietnam is what we call the domino theory. And the domino theory is the idea that if one country falls to communist, the one we're talking about here is Vietnam, then it might create a domino effect where if they fall, then their neighbors are going to fall and it's going to lead to another part of the world being overtaken by communism. By communism. So we decide to get involved. At the beginning, when they request help from the U.S., um, the French were there and the South Vietnamese, they request help. We mostly send aid and military advisor, advisors to begin with. And eventually, as most of you know, we end up sending troops. But at first, it was just aid and military advisors. So after President Kennedy is assassinated, President Johnson uh, comes in in 1963, and the war in Vietnam definitely escalates during his presidency. The big thing that's going to lead to a rise in forces and troops going to Vietnam is going to be the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And this is in 1964. And what happens is Johnson announces that North Vietnamese ships attacked American ships in international waters. And so because they were aggressive and they attacked us, it gave Johnson full military powers to stop their aggression and is going to lead to an escalation of forces. And so unfortunately, later on, we found out that the ships actually were in, were in North Vietnamese waters and not in international waters. And we kind of provoked it a little bit, but the big thing you need to know about the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution is it's going to lead to an escalation of forces in Vietnam. The turning point in the Vietnam War, we're not going to talk through much of the um, details about napalm and Agent Orange and um, 
There's a lot of guerrilla warfare during the war. But one of the big turning points during the war is going to be the Tet Offensive. And this is started by the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army. And they're going to start a surprise attack and start attacking Ma um, most of the South Vietnamese strongholds, including the capital city of Saigon. So the reason why this is a turning point is because we always thought before this that the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese Army, were disorganized, a bunch of rebels that committed guerrilla warfare and weren't well organized. And so this shows us that we were wrong and that they are very much know what they are doing. And they're not as disorganized as we believed that they were. Under President Nixon, he becomes president in 1969. He's going to have the various policies that he's going to champion in the Vietnam War. The first one is what we call Vietnamization. And this is the idea of U.S. forces gradually leaving Vietnam and then building up the South Vietnamese military to take over instead of us doing, all, doing the um, policing. And so it tries to build up their capabilities. And something I want you to think of is this is the same type of um, situation that we have in Iraq, or we had in Iraq a couple years ago when we started pulling out forces in Iraq and trying to give more control over to the Iraqi army. So this is a this is um, a strategy that has been used since Vietnam. Something else that came out of the Vietnam War, which has to do with con constitutional powers and upholding the pa separation of powers and checks and balances. So one of those principles of the Constitution, separation of powers, is going to be upheld with this act. One of the concerns that led to the War Powers Act was that Johnson was able to send, they were, he was able to send troops to Vietnam without officially declaring war, which the president can't declare war. It has to be Congress. So this is a way, this was a way for the president to send troops without having to have Congress's approval was that he was able to, so, which is what he did after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So they decided to pass the War Powers Act. And the main goal of this is to set limits on presidential power in a conflict without a declaration of war. So for example, when we sent troops to um, to Saudi Arabia and to Kuwait and when we sent troops to Iraq or we sent troops to Afghanistan we did not declare war in any of those the president can send troops but now he has to inform Congress within 48 hours and if within 60 days they don't approve it then he has to withdraw the troops so this is going to increase this is going to uphold separation of powers it's also going to give it's also going to have to do with checks and balances because it's going to give Congress another way to check the president at the end of the war, it's going to be 1975. In 1973, the last U.S. troops leave Vietnam, and but the war kept going on. So in 1975, the South Vietnamese Army couldn't keep the North Vietnamese out any further. So in 1975, Saigon falls to the North Vietnamese Army. And during this time, South Vietnamese government officials, military officers, soldiers who supported the Americans in Vietnam are going to be sent to communist re-education camps where they're going to face a lot of torture and disease, almost like they're um, kind of their punishment for supporting the Americans. So 1975, Saigon Falls, and this marks the end of the war. And then this picture is a very famous picture of people trying to escape Saigon whenever it falls.